Hello and welcome to the DMs Book Club, a book club podcast where we talk about Dungeons & Dragons and discuss how we include it into our role-playing campaigns. With me as ever, my erstwhile co-host who I drag along for these things is Hamilton. Hello, Hamilton. Hello, Fiona. How are you? I am good, thank you. I'm good, but there's somebody else in the Zoom room, and I'm, I there can is. already tell I've gone incredibly red. So I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited. I don't know if you is, uh, but I get very excited when we have guests in. Co-host number three, who yes. are you? Hello, I'm Travis Vengroff, uh, Dungeon Master and Sound Designer and Producer for Dark Dice and other things. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is, again, most of me and Hamilton were like, oh my god, Travis has agreed to come on to our <laughs> podcast. Like, how are you? How are you in this current climbs? Like, everything i'm doing i'm doing very good uh we we just got back from a wedding this last weekend Ooh. two people from our cast who met while playing our dungeons and dragons game dark dice mm -hmm. basically the two protagonists hem and Aethor, got married this weekend in iceland having met from our show oh my god and they had this moment during the wedding where they said and the priest is looking over and says and one person has brought them together and they both sort of like turned their heads toward me and there's like god <laughs> <laughs> and you're like Yes, yes. Uh, Thank you for getting my name correct, finally. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some of your photos from it on Twitter because I saw you were posting some of them and it was, uh, you looked like you had a lovely time up there. It looked really cool. So lovely. Um, yeah, that, that in itself, like we're probably going to do a bonus episode just talking about, you know, Beautiful. a Viking wedding with karaoke and lots of drinking. Um, <laughs> that sounds absolutely incredible. <laughs> did you get to see Taylor when you were up there at all? Because she's up in the Icelands. I did not. Uh, they're in Reykjavik and we, we blitzkrieged through um, oh, right, yeah. an 18-hour trip from where we are wow. down to Westman Island, Westmanjar. Oh, cool. Wow. So, yeah, like really nowhere in the, in the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, it was... It, actually, it's a boat off of Iceland. You have to take like yeah. a ferry for an hour to get. Yeah, there. exactly. It's what, yeah, it's like serious. It's a very exclusive party. Yeah, that uh, that's a cool. Thing. Though. It's so interesting that like, how you meet people and then obviously come get like I don't know if Hamilton you know this, but like when I first started out doing my first podcast, what am I rolling? My partner said I'd love to run a one shot for you a D D one with your friends. And I was like, oh cool. Well, I'll record it as a bonus episode for where. And he was like, yeah, you do that. And it turned out it was a one shot to propose to me. Uh, which obviously got revealed at the end, but I had no idea. So we were solving riddles and stuff, and I'm like there at the end going, There's some, there must be somehow to solve this bloody riddle about a ring. Oh. <laughs> and then, obviously, I solve it. And I'm like, yes, we did it. I turn around, he's on one knee, and, I, and you just hear me go, fuck. <laughs> oh <my laughs> like, I've not listened to this. What episode is this? It's like yes. really early on. It's like one of the first moments. It, it was so much fun, but you just hear me just go, oh my God. Of course, he goes, there's the whole speech of like, oh, you know, we've been together and obviously RPGs brought us together, blah, blah, blah. You know, will you will you marry me? And you just hear me going, fine, because I was so yeah. embarrassed. And all my friends were like, yay, excellent. But uh, yeah, it's it's so cool to do that. It's incredible. And now it's on a podcast. Because I was like, well, I can't, I can't not use it. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's content, it's content. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm using it for. But that's so cool that you were, you were instrumental in bringing your players together. And then, oh, that's so cool, man. That is lovely. It's been an absolute surprise for us. Like every step of the way, we weren't really expecting to make a podcast when we started. We were just like, oh, we'll record this thing. It'll be a one-off mm -hmm. and we'll have some posterity. And then it wound up being really fun. And the, yeah. the actors were really into it. So how did you get into role-playing games in general? Was it always D&D? &D? Were there other RPGs that you were interested in? So I've played a couple um, different systems. I started with like a really simplified version of D&D. &D. I was on a bus in like third or second grade. And my friend was like, you want to play a game? I'm like, sure, I'm really bored. This is a, an hour-long commute every day to and from school. It's like, well, this is a good game because it doesn't involve like a board. Like, what? I'm like, yeah, it involves your mind. <laughs> and then i was i was hooked and then he eventually moved away and i became the resident dm and that kind of never changed Ooh. but um mm -hmm. i've been really enjoying playing like third edition 3.5 uh, a smidge of second mm. bit of fourth lots of fifth mm. and uh pathfinder a bit for a while there and also uh hero system very briefly mm -hmm. uh i touched gurps it's really complicated it was yeah. scary <laughs> yeah it's too scary i've looked at the book and went yeah i'm all right thanks yeah it's, it will go yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've done a bit of the Warhammer Fantasy and 40k, uh, which are also quite fun, yeah, very complicated, it's fun. And then uh, Vampire the Masquerade, I think it's second edition, the one with the, yes. the marble cover. Yeah, mm. yeah, because they've got their player guide just coming out just now with the Vampire one as well. So you've done a lot, and for a long time, consistently, you've like always been, once you started, mm -hmm. never stopped, it's been a consistent journey. Yeah, and mostly D&D has been the consistent one, the other ones have been more sporadic uh, and mm -hmm. fun. But mm -hmm. uh, the the world that I started building a long, long, long time ago is technically the same one as Dark Dice. Yeah, I, I try and like, you know, 
I wrote this thing. It's it's a forest. What's the name of the forest? And like, uh, it's actually not that impressive. It's like the the old hand mountains or something. Like, okay, well, <laughs> if you translate that to Icelandic, it sounds awesome, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have a town I I made up, which is like it's uh, called Three Days Away. Why is that? Well, it's technically two days away by horse, but three days by walking, and it just and everyone just go talks about it, and I'm like, cool, great. That was not me panicking because like, I misspoke or something like that. So yeah, I think yeah, I, I like the fact that you did the translation because yeah, people were like, oh, that sounds cool. And you're like, yeah, just don't look at it too deeply. Uh, everything's yes. nice. <laughs> Yeah, and we have like another one that's um, that I'm really proud of. When I was a kid, I was like, "Oh, I'd be called the City of Thieves because that'll be edgy, and I'm edgy, you know, I'm a <laughs> teenager." I'm like, oh, "Okay, if I just translate that to uh, Lopol is a word that means thief in like four or five different Eastern European languages, and Vichol's a word for city." So just like, "Ah, oh, Lopol Vichol, that sounds so cool." <laughs> I mean, Google Translate is one of the greatest things to come to D and D. I think for, for for many people, as in like. How can I make this cool language or this cool world around me? Um, Just translate it. As someone who did a D&D game show and on that game show did retranslations of spells back from through loads of Google Translate back into English, that is a lot of fun. I wow. recommend that to everyone because I think Blight was renamed as Dead Palm Power. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, which I think is a good name for it. Liam and Tiny Hut was um, Chalets of the World. Ooh, <laughs> that sounds so cool. That's like an Airbnb thing. Because Le Monde, uh, yeah, it was Le, Le Monde de Hut, I think is oh. what it got to. And it went to Liam Mon's Time and Hut and it went to Chalets of the World. I and love I was like, that. That's a brilliant trick. Yeah, it's good yeah. fun to have if you if you if you're really bored with Google Translate in front of you. I was gonna say if you've got a bit of time. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it sounds like. But Travis, obviously, a lot of your work is. I mean, you say yourself it's horror based. It's a very stupid question, but like, have you always been interested in horror, or is it just something that's grown naturally over time? It's like where does that sort of spark come from? If you see what I mean. So as I mentioned, I lived an hour away from everybody else. I was in this little island, sort of really far away. There were very few kids in that island. And I was very bored. And one of the books that I had was this book on the supernatural. And I got like super hardcore into the supernatural and like vampires and rat kings and all like the Mothman. This book just had it all. And I was constantly absorbing all of this content that you think of as being generally spooky. Mm. Somewhere in high school, I, I was that guy and I made like a zombie movie, which is like one of the check boxes you've got to do. Um <laughs> And I was able to, by yeah. volunteers, get a hundred extras to show up as zombies. Oh, I, I was overwhelmed. That's cool. And if you get five out of ten people to sign a petition, you can close a street. So I closed the main street of my town and shot a zombie oh. with a hundred zombies. Oh my god! Much to the hatred great. of the movie theater. <laughs> That's that incredible. I didn't and know. The blood stains are still there to this day. <laughs> uh, we can't do that here in the UK. Yeah. Oh, like, it's the King's Road. There's no, there's yeah, yeah could, nothing there. The council ain't gonna let you do that. That's for sure. That's a, I mean, they don't close their own roads for potholes. So. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> don't get me started. But that's so cool. I love that. I find a lot of people that have got into D and D and into the podcasting world, they're always teenagers with super eights, aren't they? Really, you know, like we all basically <laughs> were. I've got a vault of me and my friend making stupid TV programs and movies and mm. taking the piss out of things. It's a common thread, but that's I'm, I never got a hundred extras and close. Yeah, things, so that's very cool. I, I did not expect to. And by the no. end, of it, there was like only like maybe forty of them stayed to the end of the shoot. But it, oh. you know, they were there for that first scene. It was a really good first scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it's really cool. I don't even know a hundred people. <laughs> but I I, either. Well, they they know you apparently. No, they just saw my flyers. I put them everywhere. I I, I got. Uh, like a hundred flyers and to put them on like the YMCA and if we're on the main street, I was going to close to them. From that then, obviously that like you were saying like you were doing D&D as sort of a, a fun thing. So what tipped oh, yeah. you over into doing podcasting and obviously doing it in such a, I think quite a unique way. It's not an actual play. It's definitely more uh, coordinated and immersive from that. So what, sort of garnered those creative choices i'll say it, it isn't the original audio is there i just edit all the npcs out and, and cut as much as i can to make it really like you're with them and you're not hearing the roles but it is the original audio uh nine out of ten times but to clarify podcasting that's another sort of thing so movies are very expensive uh and i, I don't have the ability to make <laughs> movies because they're really expensive but i wanted to be an actor and i, I kind of gave that up a long time ago mm -hmm. uh because i was going to get all these young teen roles and like dramedies <laughs> Uh, so I was like, all right, that's, that's not a thing for me. Yeah. So uh, I met Caitlin. We became really good friends. We were listening to the No Sleep podcast and Sayer and a bunch of other really cool ones. Generally horror, not because mm. we intended to, but that's just kind of, we both like horror movies. We enjoy spooky stuff, supernatural stuff. Mm. And eventually we're like, well, you know, we could 
we could make one together. That'd be fun. Or like a video game or something. So we tried programming a video game in a whole day. We got to like, hello world. And then we started the podcast thing. And in a day we had a script. Yeah. And like, I was like, oh, I know some actors. I know people who could do this. I've got friends mm -hmm. who with them. I had a friend with a microphone. I can you record the parts and I could be some <laughs> of the other parts and you could be the other parts. We were literally half the cast between the three of us. Oh. It's so much more accessible. Yeah. And we had more listeners in like the first month than people who worked on the show we or any other thing that i'd ever worked on before it was really successful mm -hmm. surprisingly and and not like you know mainstream can quit your job successful that's like five or six years later but yeah. uh it just kept working for us and horror is the genre that really launched us and mm. people liked our spookier stuff than mm. our not so spooky stuff so we've we've leaned into it and i thought for the D, &D side dark dice we had our, our cast from our show the white vault which is the background you see before me mm -hmm. Uh, it's a spooky horror podcast with human hearts and stones, not to mention bones. And the cast recently did <laughs> a live show, but I didn't know them. And I thought it'd be weird if we all just stayed at an Airbnb together and had never really spoken sequentially, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we record everything in isolation, one at a time, with no direction. So we, we said we'd play a D&D &D game, and that was Dark Dice. And uh, mm -hmm. it, we weren't going to keep it. It was just like a behind-the-scenes recording thing, one episode, but it wound up being really fun, and we just didn't stop. How many episodes did you have? Have you got through in Dark Dice? Uh, season one was sixteen. Uh, season two is divided between two parties. Yeah, uh, I think one party made it to episode eight. One party is at episode three or so, three or four. And so, yes, yeah, so you started with the one, and then did you literally immediately go, "This is something," and you were like, "Okay, now we need to organize." So for the end of season one, a lot of stuff happens, yeah. and two of the characters had run themselves backstories, mm -hmm. and I wanted to explore that, and they did too, really badly. Mm -hmm. We're like. Guys want to play a gun? Like, yeah, okay. And then <laughs> these people got married. Yeah, <laughs> so, but, like they became really good. This is part of their their growth and friendship of uh, hanging out with one another. And I had a blast the whole way through. And that's kind of what, what their side was. But mm. their story also left some other people out who they left for dead. So I wanted to also push them toward PvP, and that was yeah an exciting goal with the other team. We made like an ask, and and this this uh, we, we were able to get uh, a couple of. People I really like to also join and play with these people who were left behind and, and booster our team so it'd be even ground. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the one that you got Jeff involved in. I say Jeff like I know him first name. I was going to say. Uh, F-E-G. <laughs> Jeff G. <laughs> so, I mean, that was an amazing get. Uh, but in a surprise for me too. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I did watch a, an interview that you did with uh, Todd Kenry and you were just like, I'm, I mean, we're all shocked that we all that it all worked out. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I can imagine that being just like, pie in the sky, fuck it, just go. And then you're like, oh shit, it's happening. So. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, we, we joined, uh, we were with, uh, we were with, CAA and ICA merged, and yeah. I always get the name of the pre-merge wrong. Mm -hmm. I believe we were, we were with CAA and ICM, mm -hmm. but at the time, one of them had Jeff Goldblum, and we're like, oh, mm -hmm. well, that we should obviously join that one because Jeff Goldblum's on it. It can't be that yeah. bad. And then <laughs> when we joined, we're like, so we're doing a new season of our D&D podcast, mm -hmm. and this is like a long shot, but can we can you get a message to him? Like, well, we can get it through his agent, and this is how you do it, and this is the way you do it. Yeah. This is how professionals do it. I'm like, so I could send him something, and his agent will read this. Yes. So we made the character sheet and like get in the art. And, like, yeah. if you want to change anything, you can. Here's our vision. It's gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh fuck! <laughs> it happened. He's like, oh, well, I guess we have to do this now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and our third season, uh, by the time this is out, we'll probably have our first episode up, and that's got uh, Eric Nelson from uh, quite a lot of things from yes. Yellowstone. Holy shit. He was also the youngest daytime Emmy winner. Um, and we're, we're trying to get him some other awards there too. Oh, cool. So you said that like, you had these two sort of separate parties. Like, how was that for you? Because obviously, splitting the party is always a thing that some DMs are like, uh oh, fuck. What do I do? So, how did you, I guess, with the batch records, was it recorded separately from each other? Oh, yeah. Or? Completely. Yeah. So, like, even on the show, if somebody like runs off and does their own thing, we're like, all right, we'll record a sidebar with you like later after everyone else is off and we'll figure out what happened with you. Like, we think of it less of a game and more of a production. Yeah. So, absolutely. Your time is valuable being on my show. We appreciate you. Go take like a break and we'll, we'll or we'll reschedule another game with just you yeah. and what you're up to. And then we'll find out if you make it to get back to the party. And we can also do a little <laughs> bit more dickery with like the silent one, you know, yes. replacing and killing people. Do you see him? Things like that. We And our, our most recent game has been a lot of like splitting up the party. And mm. Caitlin is a DM and I'm a DM and we co-DM this thing. And we've been doing this at D&D &D Castle and other uh, things. Mm -hmm. And when the party splits up, we kind of each just take one group and go and split. That is so cool. I mean, that's amazing to have two DMs as well. Like, how do you find that dynamic? I mean, you know each other so well, I imagine, because you're together. But I don't know. I guess that's really the answer. I probably answered my own question. But how, how do you find that 
working. I imagine it's just come from years of knowing each other and knowing each other very well and being Great, similar vibes, yeah. but yeah. what is that process like? How does that manifest? I'm very methodical with how I plan campaigns. Mm. Actually, we release every one of our campaigns in a pen and paper form. We, we have like a best platinum bestseller on the DMs Guild, mm. which is no longer in the DMs Guild and we'll be republishing for new uh, mm. without any of the stuff thanks to the Creative Commons stuff going out. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it is really, really detailed. And I know everything in it. Caitlin knows everything in it because she helped write it. Mm. And when we split up, we're like, did they do the thing? Yeah, they did the thing. Did they interact with that? No, they went that way and did this thing. And this is what happened. Yeah. Ah, cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also, the players have to share the information with each other. Yes. Which is where we kind of catch up. So it's knowing your your story and how it's going to mesh together by session. And we're really methodical with what we're doing in each session. And the end point of what we think they'll get to 50% more and then knowing what's within. Exactly. Is there different styles between the two of you in just the way that you approach it after the fact or like once you're in the moment? Like, you know, obviously there's all the planning where it becomes a collaboration, but then once it's split, do you find that there's a difference or, do, or is, it, is it just an in sync moment? Mm. I would say she's generally better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, ha you have to say that. <laughs> but she's, she's quite spooky and I'm... I'm okay. I'm pretty good at improvising. I'm pretty good at managing chaos. So when a certain thing happens, she'll tap my shoulder and then I'm like, I'm on. And then when that's done, <laughs> I tap her shoulder and like, and then they look at you and say, and then she's oh. suddenly doing that. Or we can have multiple NPCs who we can even argue with each other. Yes. So a lot of times when we're writing scenes yeah. uh, and planning stuff, we'll try and put more than one NPC in a location so that we can both interject if we have to instead of trying to voice one character between the two of us yeah i was gonna say having that yeah that having the arguing between the two i've definitely the one time i co dm'd with my partner and we were just both goblins i was like well i am not moving the scene along until this has been resolved and eventually the, the players were like we could just we could just kill these characters i was like uh oh run away <laughs> My goblin will live to survive another day, but uh, but it was so much fun. It's such a unique experience to do that with someone on that level. And like you sound like obviously you know this was so in sync. The fact that you're writing together and obviously producing podcasts and content together, so you must be. It's just it's so nice to have that. Being in sync is really the most important part, and and knowing like what you both want out of the stuff mm -hmm. that's going to happen. Because yeah. sometimes she'll be like, "That was terrible. That was absolutely awful." And I'm like, "Yeah, it was. You could have done better, but you didn't tell me." And then we're like, okay, then we can retcon that. Maybe they'll have forgotten by the next session and we can just change that thing. Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> Benefits of pre-recording as well, isn't it? That's mm. the thing. Yeah. Our season two cast doesn't even like remember half the stuff that's happened. And we're like, so we need you to retake <laughs> this long narrative section where I yeah. describe what, a, you know, what the poison is, but mm. from your perspective or what the room looks like from your perspective. Like, oh, it smells awful in here. What's that? <laughs> Do you see that over there? Yeah. It looks like, uh... That looks like a dung pile. Why is it in here? You know, you can <laughs> give them that sort of stuff instead of us just describing like, you went to a room, it smells bad. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. And that, that collaborative, allowing that little bit, I mean, because you've talked about being very um, methodical in yourselves, but it does show that you're able to relinquish that control yes. to the players as well, which is such an amazing dynamic to to play against because mm -hmm. as someone who's done pre-recorded campaign things, it's very hard to find the line and hit those points that you want to hit and you just got to accept it after a while but also there's obviously a magic way where you can both allow that balance of giving players the option to opportunity to mm -hmm. investigate their world and manifest it themselves as much as um as much as it all coming from your mind which is what you're doing mm -hmm. i will clarify we are very real already but the players don't usually realize that they're being well I mean. yeah there's the the illusion that's yeah. the best bit of that must be a really good DMing. It's like, hey, how did we end up here? It's like, ooh, you all through your own free choice. Exactly. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying you able to man I feel it sounds and comes across that you're able to manage that yeah. process. It doesn't feel like the characters have no agency in it, or it, it feels very much like they have that ability. And small things, as you said, like mm. allowing them to describe the room or allowing you know, allowing, but you know what I mean, as in offering them the ability <laughs> to you know, it sounds like God on high, but the, you know, <laughs> those interactions are what give that sensation of everyone being involved, even though there is clearly a, a direction that's being yeah. held. It's kind of the story it's, always moves forward. I have to say that even when it doesn't move forward, it's still really nice because you get yeah. character development. Like there's going to be a whole episode of just people chatting around a campfire. That was like the best moment for me in Dark Dice was mm. uh, season one was like two people sat at a campfire. Oh, we'll take watch together. And I was like, okay, so what are you guys doing during watch? Oh, we're going to talk. Okay, I'll let you guys talk. And then they just did that for like a half hour. It was like a popcorn moment. It was amazing. Oh, and yeah. uh, apparently that's when they knew they were like 
Uh, Clearly, they'd be very good friends. Uh, <laughs> As a DM, the best moments are when I shut up for the longest. Yeah, it's definitely. Same. Because I have, like, the one I've just done in the Bowie's one that I did, there's a bit where Kim and Jeremy uh, were playing uh, whatever they were playing, because it's just going to get crazy if I start explaining it. But they start having an argument with each other. We're just all sitting there, all the rest of us, like, popcorn moment, like, watching them argue. And it was just like, this is this is just the best bit. And uh, yeah, when I get to be the audience, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's the most fun, definitely. We have a lot of player deaths, and they're not expected. They're not scripted. People just roll away, and I'm like, "You roll a what? A what?" <laughs> yeah, like, well, that character and this really cool story that we had planned for you, and all the hooks that were like relevant to you, because we were very into permadeath. That's, mm. that's a, a very big trait for us. Uh, yeah. So it's like, all right, that's that's gone. That's wow. that one. Yeah. yeah. But it that's, makes it powerful, and that makes it more tangible in the show when things because it, you become so much more attached to them and engaged. Yeah, and go. I think that's the thing. I have to tell you, we're still recording season three right now. Yeah. We've announced that it's releasing. Uh, so at this point, <laughs> it's I'm not sure they're going to make it through. I, I'm really worried about a total party kill. I, I have right. serious concerns, and if that's the end of the campaign. That'll be a really epic ending. Is just everyone's dead. If there is a TPK, is that just it? And there's no alternate. That'll be it. Oh my god. Yeah, I don't have an alternate. That that's that is the end of the story, and that is the end of their story. That's how we do things. Like, yeah. holy shit, that'll be that resolution. Then we'll have to do some sort of sequel to try and fix things later, or not, <laughs> I, depending on what they do. Yeah, or alternate dimension, or like, I mean, you're in D and D. Do you have a afterlife? Because there's fun to be had there. No, okay, there's no afterlife. No, I was like, just, just said just it. Very dead. You're oh. dead. There's no afterlife. Well, speaking of death, death. <laughs> speaking of all that sort of thing, we kind of brought you here on a false premise. Obviously, we wanted to talk about yourself and the work as a book. When I sort of pitched to sort of to you, uh, like, oh, you know, what can we talk about? You were sort of in there, like, Curse of Strahd. And I was like, excellent. <laughs> Love Curse of Strahd. For context for you, Travis, so I have read Curse of Strahd. I've r- run it through a little bit, and then I'm restarting it in a couple of weeks. So I have run it through at least once. Hamilton has played in a little bit of it and has only just finished reading it because you hadn't finished the campaign and it's yeah so this, we're, we're coming at it from all different, different angles. angles yeah how many times have you run curse of strad then i've run curse of strad exactly once in full i've mm-hmm. used elements of it in different things right i have played it once as a player in a different edition before it was curse of strad i think third mm-hmm. which is a bit different and yeah organized differently uh, and then also I had a very long conversation with an Icelandic group of men who were very enthusiastic, had drunken a little bit too much and told me all about their adventures in Barovia. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> I that's, love that. That's lovely. So what is it for you, Travis, that sort of is the hook of Curse? Like, why do you think it's so popular as one of the most played D&D adventures on like actual plays, podcasts? I mean, people constantly talk about it. Like, you just type in Strahd and people, there's cosplays, there's all the, you know, fan art. What do you think like makes it such a good adventure or good thing to to get inspiration from if you're running adventures. I think it's really easy to have a nice villain. And not many adventures have that villain who's there with you from the beginning to the middle, taunting you to the end. Like, Strahd's there the whole way through, and having an antagonist in the truest sense of the form, instead of like, I'm going to send a mini-boss after you, Strahd just shows up and is like watching you fight other things. like, yeah, you guys suck. <laughs> like, you already <laughs> run Strahd. But, like, he's there heckling you, he can mess with you in a bunch of different ways and you really hate this guy and you see what he's done to everyone and everywhere in Barovia and they're all directly tied to his personal actions so it's very hateable and I think having Strahd front and center is that they even renamed the adventure to Curse of Strahd it's not Castle Ravenloft yeah that is why it's so popular in my opinion also people maybe like horror stuff a little bit zombies (laughs) undead vampires you know it's like Star Wars, you know, Darth Vader is incredible. Like, and uh, my other, my next go-to was Hans Gruber. <laughs> the, the really great bad guy is what draws you in, and they are so cool. And the way you can play them in different ways is amazing. And I, I think D and D's picked that up because looking, well, Wizards has picked that up because their whole D and D direct recently was like Vecna's coming back. You know, another great classic villain that we all love to hate. They're bringing back the villain from the, the cartoon movies. Uh, I forget their name off the top of my head. Uh, uh, Benja. Benja with the horn. And they're bringing back the Thay wizards and Z- Zastam as well. So like it's like they picked up that thing and gone, yeah, that's what's working. Having the, the villain be there, yeah. present in most of the campaigns awesome. 
I was just so surprised by how many actual players there were. But like, as we've just said, like there's so many different ways to play it. But having Strahd there front and centre, but also the hopelessness around this place, like everything's been sucked out uh, because of this person's actions, which is ultimately tragic. Um, you know, the gothic horror element of it. So, you know, you've got your Dracula, you've got your Frankenstein, all that sort of thing. And the fact they followed it up with Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft with all these sort of mini domains of dread as well. Like, people really love that. People really appreciate, like, stepping in and being a part of that. And I think what he talks about with stuff like death as well, I don't know if you, you folks realised, uh, or, like, I only read it just today, this idea that if you die, you, you don't leave. Wherever you are stuck there. And I was like, damn, I missed that the first time around. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I I also hate the fact that if you someone's born and there's no dead souls about, they just are born without a soul. One in ten or something. Yeah. And the, everything affects everything. So, that, yeah, that soul idea. Like, if you somehow manage to get through the campaign and defeat Strahd and his many-roomed castle, uh, the mists lift. And obviously those people who have souls are able to leave, but those who don't just fade away as soon as they leave. And you're like... Is that a good thing? That doesn't feel like a good thing, but maybe it's the suffering. And I just there's just lots of questions. And I, I love how this story, you discuss it with other people. Like you said, that I love the idea that you were just discussing with these the drunk Vikings going, let me tell you. And it's just, I, that's what I love about D&D and role playing is that you can have these conversations about like whether or not you made the right decision. And it just really affects and what, what great storytelling as well that you were a part of and making choices that... Yeah, because it had this um, trope of like a sin that has been festering and it's affecting all the lives and you have to solve it even though you weren't the ones that caused it. It's such a great, oh, such an interesting thing and just like, and then you have to deal with the consequences of you solving it. My party that played also had done a thing in a certain amber location mm -hmm. and they took all of the things they possibly could and as a result they were cursed to never leave the land. So at the end they won, they were victorious and they were yeah. like, let's go. And then the only one who didn't was it's like, where'd everyone go? They sort of faded through the mist. One person didn't. Oh my God. Oh. And everybody else was just like, you find yourselves back where you were. <laughs> You're not leaving. It's a very Silent Hill moment. Like, oh, come on, Travis. I feel like you need to, wait, how long ago did you run that campaign? Yeah. Uh, it was like two, three years ago. Uh, that was at my home game. It was very fun. Because I feel like you should get those players back. And they are, they are now, must win this they time. are now like strad like figures themselves. And you've yeah. now got to get another party to Red go Lord and please. save Barovia from their like twisted like ideas of the world because they've, they've been cursed by land. I think. Oh, they totally embraced that too. They would be the yeah. perfect villains. Is there a particular part of Curse of Strahd that you really enjoyed, Travis? Death's house is my favorite. <laughs> No, how? Travis, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? I'm sorry. And so I also love the Death House. We were just discussing it because <laughs> Hamilton hates it. <laughs> it's so descriptive. Yeah. They tell you what the carpets look like in every room. Yeah. And like nothing happens in 80% of it. And it gives you so much through nothing happening. So it's just building up the sense of dread. And then when this thing does happen, it's terrifying. And things get really messed up and messy. And it's like really dust. <laughs> the thing is, you two are GMs in this game. I've been a player in this game, and the Death House is fucking annoying. I hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate that it's so many fucking rooms. I know what's happening. I know what's going to happen. There's going to be a fucking ghost. I know there's going to be something awful in the basement. I know there's not one on the map yet, but I know there's going to be one. Fucking Fred Durst's house. Let the hell. Off topic slightly, so my flatmate Mira, she also played in a game. I yeah, I think I sent you the picture, didn't I, Hamilton? But mm. and there's been a picture like forever. I was just sat on the side. I didn't know what it was. I it was a drawing. I just assumed it was like some D and D party. So one of her players in her game drew the Durst family portrait with the nanny holding the baby and has it there. You know, I was, I was obviously saying, oh, we have got you know dark dice. We got traps. We're going to talk about custom charge. She went, oh. Well, that's the Durst family. I'm just like, it's been sat there for like a year and a half. I've just been looking. At it. it's, I'll send the picture to you afterwards. It's because it's, if you look at it really close, the you know the lady of the house, Lady Durst, is like looking meanly at the nanny. And it's just like... And you wonder why you're having plumbing problems in your house. <laughs> because you have been cursed. Do you use that as the beginning of the campaign then, mm. Travis? Or did you use that? Did you? Did, well, how did you chuck that yeah, How did you get them into the, the mists, essentially? Did you use one of the plot hooks? Oh, into the mists. I, mm. I cheated. So they came from out of the abyss. And they decided oh very God. clearly, once they got out of the abyss, which is the midpoint of it, they were never going back. I'm like, but they need your <laughs> help. But like, too bad. <laughs> and everything in the under can just, you know, burn. We're never going back there. It's crazy. Those people are messed up. Like, well... <laughs> You escaped with this prince, and this prince, Darendil, is a, an NPC you can like rescue in the very, very beginning opening of that. Mm. But you know what? 
he's heard of this kingdom and they need help. So it's like, oh, Easton Hook into the mist. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, sorry, friends. And this one, you can't leave. <laughs> well, they liked him. So have you run quite a number of the published adventures and as you're part of your homebrew then? Because obviously Out of the Abyss, that's quite, obviously a few years old, but it's such a great one with demons and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I've, I've done quite a few. Uh, did Out of the Abyss, I want to run a Fire and Frostbite and haven't done that yet. Um, mm -hmm. We've done Fendelver. We've done that one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Storm King's Thunder, I got about halfway through before the party broke up. Because they got married and then got jobs and then split up and we all moved. Oh, real life. Boo, the big enemy. I know. The worst one of all. We did the Dragon uh, Dragon Heist. Lord of the Dragon King. Oh, Dragon oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Dragon Heist. That's it on my list. Yeah. And we did parts of, of cults and, and everything from the Yawning Portal. Everything from the Yawning Portal, which is just oh, my fun. gosh. Yeah. Love those. So, how long would an average campaign take you then? Did, would you meeting like regularly? It just, because like, I mean, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Like, we couldn't even get through, like, six sessions of Curse of before and all the timing and people getting married and all that sort of thing happening. So, like, how, how do you do... What's the secret to getting through all these adventures? Well, just getting <laughs> consistency. Uh, if you can get, like, a four-hour block with people, mm. uh, you can get through a campaign in, let's say, uh, da -da -da, seven of those. So it's, like, seven of those. And if you do it weekly, it's, like, a couple months, like, two mm. months, three months. You're obviously going to miss a few. That's okay. But four hour blocks is kind of the secret. And then mm -hmm. socialize before or after, have people not be distractible when you're playing, um, those sorts of things. Even if you'll wind up spending like the first hour just catching people up and getting back into character. So if you could play for longer. Do you do guys you guys do a lot of book campaigns? Um I I was in a homebrew campaign for about five years on and off Mondays, which we've all really enjoyed. But then we've got we got to level twenty, we finished it only just very recently. Loved it. And now we're like, now what? So, so that's hence why I'm going back into Curse of Strahd and hopefully with the weekly stuff. But yeah, it's definitely going down to sort of like obviously because it's all online still for us. Uh, we we've got we we went from three and a half hours down to two hours currently because people are late getting in and stuff like that. So, but I completely agree. Like having that time to socialize, just to even just chat about stuff and just get that out, is just it's so valuable. And especially again, I don't know about yourself, Travis, but like at the end we're like, okay, bye, and I'm just like going. I have so many feelings and I don't have the bus ride home to talk about it to anyone. So I'm just going to sit here and text my mum and tell her that my character in game has feelings. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, again, I just look over at this very sad pile of published adventures going, one day I would like to play and run these games, but maybe it, when will that be? So it's it just, I just find it really impressive that you were like, yeah, all these ones. I'm like, what? We've not even done one. Well, I used to have in-person friends who who played D and D. That was quite fun. Uh, mm -hmm. But now we're we're in Germany. I have to. I don't know enough German to run a campaign in Germany yeah. yet. I mean, I'm almost you do there. so many other things. I would yeah. be like, oh man, and now I have to do it in German. Oh well, you're bilingual, and I'm digging German and English. But... <laughs> One day. Back to Strad. I wanted to yes. ask. What's your Strahd like? Mm. How do you play Strahd? How do you embody? Because I think that is something that, because he is so iconic, but has all these goals. And I think it's very well fleshed out in the book. Yeah. But I think even within that, it's the key factor in the story. You've mentioned that yourself. Like, yeah. I think everyone approaches Strahd in their own way. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how mm -hmm. you, you, you took, on, took on that mantle. Yeah. I, I try to cater everything that I'm doing to the players because that's important. So there, there are specific ticks where aristocracy, like, uncaring corporate aristocracy so he was <laughs> i say corporate just to kind of give you like the mindset so you have strad being the aristo who doesn't care and in a lot of regards because he owns everything and he feels like he owns everything and he is the land the land is him so he'll look at you from behind a window and you're inside of a house and he'll let you think you're safe and then like later he'll just walk in like you realize i own everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or he'll, yeah. he'll kill one of the main characters uh, one of the players died to Strahd and his spirit was just summoned on a whim because Strahd's a dick and he's like this is one of your friends yeah he's staying with me Fuck, I hate him I love, love it this. so love good it. <laughs> and if you hit him he doesn't show emotion or pain it's like you do really descriptive like you hit something and this happens and you know everything uh, skeletal arms fly everywhere you know whatever you're doing with him he just doesn't even flinch yeah. First fifty hit points, <laughs> and no that. visible damage. First fifty. Mm. So that was that was my uh, very dickish, like bit of Dracula inspired yeah. super Aristo. What do you guys? How did you run Strad? So there is a supplement called "She Is the Ancient" by Beth the Bard. Um, yes. Which, of course, typically I read the first page of it. I was like, okay, Strad is female, and so I started running it. And then I read the rest of the book after. Obviously, we stopped the campaign, and I was like, I have made a huge error and not read this before because it's such a cool idea of like. What does this mean if the character is female or is 
an older person or a younger person because they change the ages of a few people as well and swap those genders. And sometimes it's such a subtle change, but everything about that, I was just like, I want to do that, especially because uh, oh, it was so funny because like, yeah, when we get him, and I was like, yeah, I mean, I had already re- got rid of all the pronouns and stuff like that, so it was always they, they, they. And like, yeah, when we get him, and so she appeared really early on. I was just with them at the campsite and everything like that, and they all went to sleep bar one, you know. And then eventually, the person I was playing was like, "Fuck, fuck, what? Wake up, everyone!" And then I was like, "Yeah, the camp's already on fire. It's already, it's already too late." late. And so I, I definitely was like, when I read that supplement, I was like, "That's really cool. What if?" And just changed it from that. But it had to come from that basis of like a really interesting, as you sort of described, this sort of role playing. Like one thing that came out from the the book was that this person's monstrous, right? There's no reasoning, even though they are charismatic, they are, they feel reasonable and like, yeah, you could do a bargain with them. That for me was such a cool character touchstone. So that's why I just always embody this idea of like, oh, what a nice person. Like, they're, you know, they're so charming. And every time she appeared, they were like, oh, fuck off. We don't trust you at all. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and just on the bank, waving them off and all that sort of thing. Very, very much how I would be, I think. I've definitely, I've, most of my characters are myself <laughs> from an extended point. But yeah, that was my sort of um, idea of Strahd. It's weirdly, we're both on it. It's like being a bit of a dick, but... <laughs> that's lovely. That's that's very lovely. Mm. And you, you haven't run it yet, but if you did run it, how would you run Strahd? Yeah. I think just going off my own nature, they're just going to they're going to be much campier than that, definitely. <laughs> they're just they're just going to be so much more frivolous. And I think, but that frivolity being so overplayed, mm. and then they'd find the core. That's how I would play it. So I would be super overtly friendly, overtly generous, and really try and break down that barrier until they finally, finally believe it's fine. And then kill them all basically that's so how i do on it because i that's it, it's um really super evil david bowie and labyrinth is what i'm thinking <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> when yes, he does that yes. you know he's like playful and dancing and talking about and the next minute he's gonna basically kill you you know like and and chuck you in a bog you know like and so it's kind of that but i'd want you to feel so comfortable that you uh that's how i play it basically i would like to do it one day but uh, I don't know when. <laughs> the other thing that sort of things obviously we got Strahd, but I also think because obviously the sandbox element of it, you can go to any of the bits in in order. You could go straight to the castle if you choose to, etc. But I really love. It's a bad idea. <laughs> I I mean, don't do it. I'm sure they'll do it. But I love. I'm as a GM. I sometimes really struggle with it. lots of lore and and, lots, and I found it a bit overwhelming when I was reading the book at first. But the fact that you have these three very distinct settlements and towns, and everything okay. else is sort of I would say DLC, but really law rich and really interesting so the, obviously you have barovia which you can start in obviously like this is a ship place because uh, there's castle ravenloft etc and then you've got the lackey which i think has one of the coolest concepts that there's always a festival and you know all will be well and we're all there going all is not well what are you doing you know uh, just oh that's heresy fucking <laughs> <laughs> burgermeister and then you have kresik as well, which is, this, is again, not very Frankenstein-esque, like, you know, you, you go in and you're like, get letters in, we have wine, we also have some that's died, uh, and then, you know, you find out what's been happening in the Abbey, and it's three very distinct places, and then the wilderness, and it's like, you could go to this windmill, you can go to this temple, you know, and it's just like, such such little touchstones, but I just think it makes Barovia itself, this valley, such a character, and one thing I would love to bring in when I run it again, there's a game called The Between by Jason Cordova, which has various set like day phase, night phase. And in the night phase, you have this element called the unseen. And it's like the character of London that's happening at the same time. So there's like a parallel story. And you can have it so that you give a prompt to a player saying like, hey, there's this hotel with many rooms. What's in one of the rooms? And the player can narrate that. And then you cut back to what the main action is and you keep going back and forth and having echoes almost between these two stories which don't directly relate and that's what i'd love to see is like an unseen narrative that's happening with barovia itself because i can imagine you'd be like hey there's that little temple where uh there's kids are hanging out in the sanctuary what's one of the kids playing with and then what's happening when the armor gets stolen etc and just having that collaboration with the players it's just something that i that's something i would really really want to put into my games having that character of the setting, because it's such evocative in that front. One of our characters briefly died and came back. They were able to get to get revived in time. So we mm-hmm. started giving them flashbacks of a different person's soul. 
because the souls thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. they were. Uh, Strahd has this assistant. I'm trying to remember. Oh, um, yes, the Dusk Elf. He does some terrible crap. Like, yeah. this terrible dude. Mm -hmm. Basically, this was like one of the lackeys of our friend dude, uh, lackey guy, and just experiencing like some of the really terrible crap that Strahd has done in the name of like sometimes not really good things, but sometimes it's yeah. in the name of love. But it's really misguided. Yes, just like Strahd. So, like they got a bit of the history through these flashbacks uh, that they they experienced every time they were camping. I love that. I'm I'm that's that's awful, <laughs> but amazing <laughs> in, a, in a great way, in the greatest possible way. I think the whole bit you were talking about going back to these Vikings explaining to you how their game is. I think shared trauma. I think shared trauma is what this is all about. This is what I think this game is. I think it's like when people go tell war stories, and I think people do that with D and D, but I think people do it with Strahd most because it's like mm. I fucking survived this, okay, and I'm gonna yes. fucking tell you about it. You know, I want, I need to, I need to let you know what I've seen. But um, with that, why don't we give you the opportunity to be some, have some catharsis? And <laughs> I'd love to. I'd, I thought it would be nice to hear. Is there a moment from it that you felt really encapsulated your campaign of it that you had with your players that just felt like this cemented or would express like why I love this and what was great about it? A bit like when you're telling me about your campfire talk story and Dark Dice, so something like that. Yeah, it's a snapshot. Sure. So I, I like to think of myself as being a pretty decent DM and planning for every possible <laughs> inevitability and, and yeah. thing. Yeah. And my players got to the castle. They saw the front entrance. They said, F that. Yeah. Uh, they used a series of spells to get onto the roof. <laughs> they went by like the side there's a side way you can go up and then they found like a way in it's like a window and they were able to teleport or like dimension doors i forget how they did it but they they got through this they could see it and they got in and the first thing they saw was like a fireplace and they went through the fireplace so they found the actual treasury not the false one the actual, oh, actual one the actual and that's their that was their entrance and then within the same session they went like four more rooms and they reached strad and they they battled Strahd and just like literally followed him straight through to they, they were able to get him uh they destroyed the heart uh yeah. thing they had oh. destroyed because that was right where he was yeah it was the perfect like I, I didn't give them any directions yeah. it just went no. place to place to place to place to place and finished the whole thing in one session and I was like no the castle in one session they literally did the 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 sort of speed run <laughs> speed run castle Ravenloft in under four hours they speed ran they killed Strahd they freed yep. the land and then it was like well I guess this is our last session of this and with these characters what do you mean I'm like shit you go through the mists <laughs> but <laughs> you go, I you now. and then like uh, the one character who made it out got to the tavern Mm -hmm. Felt like the others were still there. They were, you know, because it's like the Sally yeah. Hill thing. But yeah, yeah, that's so cool. That's uh, that, yeah, that's bonkers. I I feel, I would have been like, how? But yeah. that that's that's so D and D in one thing. Like, yeah, they just did it. Oh well, <laughs> well less work for me. <laughs> <laughs> You've all had that moment. I've said on this podcast many times, my void dragon force caged void dragon, and I was like, got right to the end, big boss battle, but void dragon. I'm like, here it comes, force cage. Cool. So that's the session done. Uh, you win. <laughs> Judas. <laughs> Thanks for your inspiration token. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to go cry in the corner now. Bye. <laughs> that's a great moment to have had. I love that. Did you, was there any of the key parts in the thing? Did you, did they meet Mordenkainen? Hint, hint. Spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> they did. Uh, we, we made him a bit more of a Rick and Morty. Um, <laughs> love uh, it. <laughs> uh, it was around April when they met him, and we used yeah. it to to do a brief one shot of the Rick and Morty. Yes. Um, yeah, we've adventure. talked about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should, oh, that that was yeah. How uh, side note? How was that to run as as a DM, Travis? Very fun. Yes, the only puzzle yes. that stumped them was the pirate puzzle from Captain A Hole. That's <laughs> <laughs> really so good. Oh my god. Oh. Yeah, so it was it was Rick from Rick and Morty, basically. Uh, that was like I imagine it wasn't Morty, but that would be amazing. And now oh, when, when, when I when they meet Morton kind if I run it. Oh jeez, man, because that could be that could be him post mind blank. Yeah, and he turns into Rick once he sort of cures him. But exactly. you could have him as like, oh jeez, or oh, Jerry, geez. even worse. Oh no, not Jerry. <laughs> no. <laughs> They did everything but the werewolves. Really? Interesting. Yeah. So that was going to be my next question. Was there a part that you found, Travis, that you were like, eh, I don't want to run this? So there's the Amber Temple is the total party kill temple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In the Yawning Portal, there's <laughs> at the very end this dungeon that says it will kill you. Like it's the Tomb of Horrors. Yeah, Tomb of Horrors. It, yeah, yeah. And it'll, it'll kill you. Your whole party will just the whole point climb of into the mouth of death and all die one after the other, like Lemmings not realizing that they're killing themselves. <laughs> like 
that's actually a thing you can do. Yeah. I felt like, uh, to a large degree, the Amber Temple had a lot of that going on. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're yeah. not really careful and really sharp, you can instant TPK with, like, yeah. a fireball or something trap. I thought it was very similar to uh, White Plume Mountain, talking about Yawning Portal. I thought it was, like, mm -hmm. that level. Because it wasn't quite Tomb of Horrors, but it is the sort of, like, White Plume Mountain, you can take the wrong turn and be easily screwed. And yeah. As much as the Death House does that a little bit as well. <laughs> but, it, but in a different way. In a different way, and not in the same sort of very classically dungeon crawly way that Amber Temple is. But it does feel like the Amber Temple does some really cool elements of it, but you'd have to be at a certain point with a certain thing and talk yeah. to a certain thing. And it's just like, there's a lot of stuff, which again, we not to doubt players, as we've heard, players have one shot of the castle in a session. But I'm just like, there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen, these sort of conditions for it to happen. And whilst I really enjoyed like, you know, these entities and all that sort of thing, I thought I would rather just put that in as a oh, there's a shrine on the road to somewhere and you camp near it and you hear voice, you know, rather than, like you said, this sort of death trap thing. I'd rather make it as a random encounter that is a small room rather than having to do stuff. But that was, yeah, I completely agree with that. I think the other place I was thinking of um, yeah. is, is the werewolf stuff. I really enjoy it. It just feels like there's already so much going in and maybe, for me, not enough connection to the politics of it compared to, like, say, the Vistani, which obviously has a bit more of a tie to the setting a little bit. And I guess because yeah, one of the werewolves you find in the castle at some point, you're like, well, we better go finish this side mission once we've done Strahd, you know? And it's like, I just, I don't know, for me, I guess it's a, it's a nice to have. but I It's might... the DLC. Yeah, yeah, 100% DLC. It's the pay-to-play DLC, not like the required fun. <laughs> yeah, I, we just cut it. I was like, yeah. just, they didn't use the hook to get into the world with werewolves. They didn't encounter any of them. It doesn't go. It doesn't really go anywhere great. It's not like, oh, this is such a payoff for all of this. Yeah. Unlike the paladins. Did you do the paladins with the dragon? Yes. Yeah. That, that, that was so super cool. So that was yeah. one of your favorite parts, I take it. Never got to play it. I, when I was reading it, I was like, I love this. This is fun. I would so be involved in that. But anything with dragons in, I'm, I'm, a, bit of a, I'm a bit of an easy <laughs> win. But I thought it was really well put together. But I was just wondering yeah, how to do it. Eric and Vost That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's, again, it's one of those things. We, we didn't even get far enough into it to do that. But on, I was like, of all the ones I wanted to do, wanted them to do, definitely Argon Vols Holt. Because it was just, yeah, because it's so interesting. It has so many cool little characters and stuff. And yeah. obviously it would be helpful. Exactly. I know uh, we've not really mentioned it, but the, obviously the fortunes of Ravenloft, the idea that every time you do it, it changes, right? So you could play it through a number of times, which no other adventure yeah. really does. Like obviously we know like Dragon Heist, you could have a different uh, baddie or whatever, but this felt so player generated and you could redo the card thing. You could do it before you play it and then just tell them that result or you could just be like, let's just do it now and and change it every single time or, or whatever. And I just thought, I love that because it keeps you on the, your toes as a GM. As Hamilton knows, I love a good prop. So of course I had the cards. Yeah, yeah. I had my I had a second camera over my table and I did it for them then and there and they're they're all like this trying to see what the cards <laughs> were because um, obviously all online. But I and I'm gonna do that again when we when we restarted because it was just so much because it was fun because then I was like I don't know what that card means but it's probably not good. Let me check my book. Yeah, it's not good. You don't have it. Is anything good? Oh, oh, you got the good card. There's the really nice sunshine happy card, which yeah. will be the Burgermeister in this stupid festival. But uh, <laughs> there's one that's like the object you need to seek is pretty much in this room. Or like really, oh, yeah. <laughs> did you do them at the beginning, in the middle? How did you bring them in? So we got into uh, Barovia. We I just had her in Barovia in the bar. I was like, all right, you guys, are here. let's start this right. The, she wants to talk to you. This is important. It's going to happen now, so that I know where the f this campaign is going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I let them like yeah. cut the deck, and that was like you know all dramatic. We got them all at different times in my game. Oh wow. So one of them got them from the Vistani before they entered. They had a reading from a Vistani and they had this card straight at the beginning and then the rest of us got it got it slightly differently and at different times. So the, the GM I think just did it the, their own way, which is actually quite fun because it was sort of it wasn't like, oh, then we all got them. It was like a couple of people did it then and then someone found one and it was kind of very much like put together and I thought that was a really before I read the book, I was like, I, I didn't even know they actually related to the actual. Because when I got mine, it was just like, you get this thing, which was, uh, well, I played the campaign as two different characters. I was in it for a bit. I went away and then I came back. When I came back, I was the mad mage of Mount Bartok, right? I did not know who I was. Your secret identity. I did not know my secret identity because 
That was the point of my character. Oh, jeez, oh, man, I'm bored. <laughs> and that's, I had to, I played a, a very, like, crazed Scott, basically. That's how I plays it. And, uh, and I had no idea until, and I had to leave the campaign again. No one told me. No one told me until Fiona said, you do know that's Morton Kynan. And I was like, <laughs> you're fucking joking. I was Morton Kynan. I did not do that justice. That's for sure. But, but I think that was good though. Cause then, yeah. Cause then you could just play it your own way and you weren't, yeah. there's no pressure to do certain. But that was what my tarot card was. No. Yeah. Now I know what it means. So that was the thing. So it related to that understanding, which is really cool. And that's the only one I got. Cause my other character never made it that far. But some of the cards as well, they sometimes say, ah, oh, this item is not within the realm. And so you're like, well, yeah. you don't, you don't get that item to help. And that I think is, it's brutal. You could say like, well, you could take these cards out or they're all in the castle or that, you know, so it's really varies on like what you want. So as a GM, you could always pick, but there is something joyous about doing it at the same time, Graham. Oh, shit. Okay. Never mind. Like... Here and here. Okay. Yeah, I have to work out, like, oh, but what bits do I have to reread? Absolutely. Yeah. Just, I, I'm, I'm traveling around a bit, but did you, um, you said you came out from, out of, you came out of the abyss. You came from out of the abyss. Directly out of the abyss and into the Barovia. What level did you bring them in at? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was three or four. It wasn't very high. I keep my players really low leveled. I just remembered my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, they rescued an NPC who thinks she's a cat. Oh yeah, the meow meow person. Yeah, <laughs> but she became like they're like Irina, you're cool. We're yeah. gonna kick you out of Barovia so you can be safe. This is our new best friend. We're going to train her to be a war. And they like over the course of the campaign, which was uh, some months because we didn't <laughs> meet as regularly, and it was actually a bit longer because um, it's just you, you can do everything in the book. Yeah, they got this really socially awkward individual who'd been kind of abused and like got her out of her shell and to being like basically a full-fledged adventure with them by the end that was very like that was that was really cool yeah uh, sorry for sidetrack there but no, no but, that's great yeah but that's the thing we always miss when you hear about like when you people talk about like actual players like oh critical role all this thing they always focus on the big funny dumb moments or the big like combat moments or anything like that but actually the catharsis of a payoff like Hey, we we brought this NPC along for the ride. We want to train them and be the best person they can be, and we want to support that this imaginary person. Um, like we had several of those in our five year long campaign, and I, I know, like at the end of it, I cried. But there was so many really good payoff. We we talked about all the NPCs and what they got up to, and where are they now? And it was just like, yay, they all had nice, fulfilling lives. Which maybe is different to Strahd, obviously, but it's just <laughs> yeah, like they all didn't. <laughs> but but it was just it was just like this is very wholesome, and I like that. I like that kind of storytelling where we all we all have a shared experience of this imaginary thing but we appreciate it and like even now like when i go to the pub with my best friend david and we'll sit down and he goes i really enjoyed this session i will talk about how great we are <laughs> about the session and how fun it was to play in it and it's you don't really get that too much of the, like with board games or maybe uh video games you don't get that connection that with somebody else when you're creating a, an incredible story a horror i think does that big element because you drives people together or apart compared to like maybe high fantasy where you are driven together against a common cause I, I don't know it's just i just find it really interesting this idea of collaborative storytelling i think it's sometimes people sort of maybe poo poo it a little bit like and i know, I well, know that's but, why that's why we record it that's the I, whole yeah to show we... them like yeah, we've got to we've got to show them. I, I agree with you on on all those points, and I I, I wish more people did record their stuff because I our, our Reddit or not our Reddit our Discord has some really amazing adventures they talk about all the time. Like I, w I would listen to your show. <laughs> yeah, it's like nice. <laughs> I think on your point on NPCs, show me a party that does not adopt an NPC Agreed. and absolutely falls in love with them, uh, and if they don't, you should probably leave that group because <laughs> there's something like, like a bash because it's like a bash because. <laughs> That is the best thing about D and D. I think is some of those those unexpected people. I think so. The, so yours was the cat in that game. Did it, it, was there any others that you felt? That, was there anyone else in that in that that they found hope within? Was there anyone they found hope outside of the hopelessness? They rescued a boy from the windmill, or was it the town? Uh, like, yeah. Oh yeah, the fate of the windmill. Uh, I think his name is like Luskin or something. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucian, and they. Also, like, they realized after a while, like, we, we shouldn't take this kid with us. We're just going to put him in this... We're going to bring him to... Uh, what was that? Uh, not what Palaki. Um, Kretsk. Kretsk. Yeah, yeah, Kretsk. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, we're going to bring him here. He'll be safe here. And yeah. they got him, like, safe oh, there no. with that nice priest man. Oh, 
oh no, you full metal alchemist, that false child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all really, yeah, there's no safe places there, 100%. I was trying to think of my own, because um, yeah. uh, we, yeah, because uh, the, the, the windmill, cause, but we went past the windmill when we did it, and they were like, no, we're not going in there. Yeah. Are you mad? After Durst House, we saw the windmill, and we're like, that's, I remember the windmill, no. That was how we went with it. On the horizon. Where yeah, it was seen. Like, yeah, yeah, they're like, exactly. nah, nah, no thanks. But the one I always remember doing is actually that, yeah, really early on in uh, in Barovia is the uh, Doru and the priest of the church where you go to bury the burgomaster. Yeah. And it was such an interesting, I didn't know how they were going to take it. So it's this idea that, you know, the person is there and they said, well, we're going to wait till morning because obviously things happen at night. And underneath in the catacombs is the sun of this person at begging to be let out and crying and stuff. And it's, again, I might have might have laid it on a bit thick because my players were like, well, we ain't going down there. I was like, cool, you're going to hear this hour upon hour upon hour. And it was, again, you were talking before about that, those, those little moments. We had a lot of chatting in that episode where I didn't, every so often i go, <laughs> like from nowhere. And it was so much fun. And, and it was one of those things where obviously we'll have to redo it when, when it comes out, but maybe it will change. Maybe Doru gets out uh, and has already done stuff, you know? So it was just something that I really enjoyed that because it was such a an impasse for the players who were like, well, we can't do anything because we don't want to upset this person who thinks that they can be redeemed, even though there's absolutely no way, you know? So mm. that that for me was such a, I absolutely loved that bit. So yeah, yes. it's, what I, it's what I always think about when I come to Curse of Strahd. That's a very... That can be a really sad moment, and um, I'm I love those. Mm. We I write pen and paper adventures as well, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Domain of the Nameless God. Uh, I I tried to make that really <laughs> uh Consider purchasing the book on our Patreon, <laughs> please do, uh, or elsewhere. We we tried to put a lot of those sorts of moments in. I took a, a bit of inspiration uh, from exactly the stuff that you're talking about. Like they're there to rescue children, and they've got to rescue children, and each one of those kids is a backstory and a family when they come home. Mm if they can get them home. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing is that it, it, it's such a powerful one comparative to all the others, like because it, and, and in that hopelessness and I, mm. horror does that to us. And the horror that I like more is the gothic horror. I'm not so much like Saw and all those sorts of movies. I, I'll watch Crimson Peak and I'll watch all those sorts of like, that's not even that horror but you know what I mean? Is in like, yeah, I'll watch Dracula and the sort of more over the top sort of stuff just brings the humanity so close to you, doesn't it? And I think um, that that's what I think Strahd has over so many others because it's just like, it's like being in a war zone. It's like, it's just horrific at all times. And, but as a party, you are so, as you said, forced together. Mm. It, did you notice that? Because is this the same group that you played with? You said out of the abyss, but you played with this same group with other games as well before you came to Curse of Strahd? They did out of the abyss and Strahd and a couple of one shots. Yeah, that's that was my Portland group. I just can imagine that during the Strahd compared to the out of abyss, the party kind of connected more. Or I imagine uh, did it? Out of the abyss was was straight up horror when I read it. Okay. I. <laughs> Oh, okay. They started in prison. Uh, oh, right. you know, they, they got captured. It was terrible when they oh, were escaping. Okay. They were fleeing demons, and yeah. But it's a diff that's a different. Well, it may, it may be the way you play it, isn't it? But it's a different kind of horror because that is just like, fuck. <laughs> you know, everything's. <laughs> we got a yellow card where they're like, okay, we yeah. might have to like stop playing because it's getting really creepy because they got yeah. a cape and they're just a bunch of blind people like breathing oh, okay. loudly. You did, you like, you did make it scary. <laughs> okay, you know, yeah, I, I, I might have, I might have got overboard. <laughs> okay, I really, okay, I actually kind of want to play in one of your out of this game because yeah. that sound really good that it makes out the abyss sound really good <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're releasing a uh, a book for a an underdark campaign we wrote called darkness under the mountain it'll be oh. out next year oh cool oh, so available on our patreon i guess my sort of one of my penultimate questions to you travis is that if there was any bit of advice you could give to somebody running curse of strad yes what's the main takeaway you'd want people to do when running it possibly for the first time i would say if you understand the core story which is like the first three pages, it's yeah. actually reading and it's three pages and that's not fun. But understanding those three pages and like who Strahd is gives you everything else. And you could basically just go, all right, they're going to start here and just read. You can literally go chapter by chapter through it. You don't have to know the rest of the story. You just need to know the core of what it is so, mm -hmm. so that you can start to leave your breadcrumbs and think like, okay, well, I want to share this information with them in some way that's interesting because the book does not give you how. It gives you the pieces and yeah. you're building your own roguelike and yeah. that can be daunting if you mm. look at the entire roguelike options all of them at once oh yeah but if you just take piece by piece it's it's a lot more fun 
when you consider chapter four is the castle and you're like what so yeah definitely reading it in those chunks and just like just you know my mind to your mind just spreading it out and taking your time with it i yeah 100% agree with that i was gonna say is there anything you would have changed if you were to run it again that you did mm. like that you did last time that you're like oh, fuck i wish i should have done that or i wish i'd done this differently or added to it or whatever something along those lines not all the players are on board with the amber temple options so i would cut the like being able to suck evil powers and make yourself evil because mm. one of the players had not fun as a direct result and i was like um that would be the only change i'd make it depending on the party yeah yeah i guess that's fair i think the other major character that i had on my list is barovia itself mm -hmm. and I just wanted to see how did you approach that? Like, what was yeah. your inspiration outside of what's in the book? Was there something that you took to it? I mean, and mm. that's films or whatever, and, and that could that can branch off if you want. But that was kind of my other sort of kind of key character to, to talk about, really. I forgot to mention I played a bit of Call of Cthulhu stuff. So just the really depressing, bleak, like Lovecraftian, <laughs> they've seen too much, but they're now used to it. And that's even more scary in some ways. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of snitches in the the town as well who will yeah. get you so uh drawing a lot from friends of mine who'd grown up in places like russia uh when yeah. it was maybe not so cool to be there yeah yeah the idea that they don't see adventurers that often and so you know what that means mm -hmm. and just like that rising suspicion and eventually yeah they're like oh they're here and i'm hoping to save themselves by pointing out to the to estrad's uh forces which, yeah, I think that was the thing to me. If I, if I have a plan, which it's fine, my players don't listen to my podcast because <laughs> they're not in them. Um, but the, my idea would be at some point having the, the the leaders of the towns try and come together because like, oh, the heroes are here. Maybe we could do last hurrah. And then the Dusk Elf uh, coming and saying, like, you have one shot, otherwise we burn everything to the ground and have that big confrontation, almost like Beauty and the Beast style. Uh, it's my idea. But mm. will the players go for it? Probably not. But in my head, that's a set piece that I would love to see is that a standoff that like, you give us the adventurers or we burn the whole of the lackey and see where that leads them and whether they go into the castle with the forces behind them or would they be betrayed, you know, depending on how how they've interacted. Because uh, I'll be honest, they, they might okay. not interact very well. <laughs> I see. I see. So we have a core difference of what our perceptions of the people are. Yours mm. is there; they would fight. Mine was they'd given up hope so long ago yeah. when they saw the adventurers. Their response was, "Why are you here? You're only going to bring pain to us. Mm. Like you shouldn't have failed." Like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm not going to give you a quest. Leave me alone. <laughs> like, if you're yeah. here, this is a bad thing. You cannot stay at my inn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'd probably get down that route as well. I think that's the way. But it's like the doors I... shut on you. If anything, if, if if not, and if the people that are going to be nice to you, they're your snitches. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. It's like sad Eeyore. Like you feel bad for these people because they're afraid of you in in a sense because yeah. you represent something bad that could something that could ruin their lives instantly. Except for the wine, because we had a, a sommelier was one of the players, and he's like <laughs> actually distributes wines. So when they heard there was wine involved, like we're going. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. I love that. Oh uh, well, uh, Travis, we're going to have to wrap up, but thank you so much for coming on and letting letting us talk at you, talk with you about Good Um you. Before we go, uh, where can we find your work? Are there any projects you can talk about? Anything yeah. that we can put signal boost? Mm. Uh, please take it away. Where can we find your stuff? You can find all my books on patreon.com slash fool and scholar. We're working on a way to print them. They'll be available at some point in the future. We'll also have digital copies on our website at some point. Uh, that'll be darkdice.com. Uh, we have a show, Dark Dice. It's spooky. It's fun. Uh, season three is out and it's got Eric Nelson, who's a lot of fun. And also Lily Pichu, who is lovely. And a bunch of other people. You recognize the cast of season three from the White Fault. If you're listening, Shores of the Silver Thrum, uh, let us infect you with sound. Beyond that, you can also play the adventure on our Patreon. Uh, there's, uh, there's one more piece of information. It's kind of important. Uh, you can find us on all the social medias uh, at Dark Dice Pod and check all of it out basically and probably join the patron because it sounds like <laughs> this guy knows how to write things by the way if you haven't I, figured I, that I, out by now i think things are happening for you travis i don't know try and, <laughs> and you can think of soundtrack too we we just got more oh. tracks by sakamoto uh the final oh. fantasy composer um oh. sakamoto what? from tactics and 12 and, yeah uh yeah. as of this point we'll be able to announce also that yuzo uh from act razor and streets of rage has joined our team as well so uh we're we're excited for all the cool things we're 
that's so come for the horror stay for the hurdy-gurdy yeah. <laughs> I, I love how like you're like yeah this this and this and we're all there going like what and you're like i've just got used to it now i'm just gonna yeah i can't going. take it I'm, I'm just i've got i've got to that point in barovia where i've just given up because like it's, it's too much it's too much yeah this is great but that's awesome but also, we'll—I mean—we'll be seeing you in person as well because we'll all be at MCM we London, yes, uh, which will be exciting. So, and I mean, I don't know if it's all been confirmed yet, but you've got panels and stuff. You've been helping out with that. We'll be on three or four panels yep. uh, throughout most of Saturday and a little bit of Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be also—we'll have a booth in the creator section, and we'll mm -hmm. be giving out lots of things, stickers, and we'll have special dark dice pins uh and and white vault pins for those of you who are interested very exciting exciting yeah so i think we'll we'll be around there as well be like hello we're also yeah. here but, but look at travis's stuff i'm just gonna basically sit with the bastards basically all day that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> Yes. Oh, right. The backwater bastards. Yes, that yes. is. Yes, they, it's not I talk about them a lot on this podcast. The the yeah. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Travis. And yeah, thank yes. you so much for taking our time.